Hello everybody and welcome to today's video. Today we're going to cover a little bit of a new topic which focuses on velocity, acceleration, and the second derivative. If you took physics in grade 11 or grade 12, you're probably familiar with velocity and acceleration. But in case you're not, I'm still going to go over what those terms mean and how we use them in physics as well as in mathematics. So today we're going to cover some useful definitions, which of course include what average um, acceleration, velo velocity, displacement, things like that mean. And then we're actually going to talk about different problems we'll face during this chapter and how to solve them. So let's get started on that. So again, if you took grade 11 or grade 12 physics, you'd probably uh, talked about average and instantaneous velocity and acceleration and how you could determine those using kinematic equations. Well, Isaac Newton, our good boy over here, actually came up with calculus to help him solve very difficult physics problems, right? Because back then they didn't actually know enough math to describe the kind of situations we face in our everyday life. And so in order to do that, he came up with calculus. And today we're going to learn about how we can use calculus that we've learned so far to apply it to some physics problems. So the concepts that we need to know for today is displacement, velocity, and acceleration. Displacement is essentially the distance and the direction of an object has moved uh, from the origin of some, like some place over a period of time. So all that means is that if I was, for example, right here, right, this is where my starting point is, my displacement when I moved over here would be this distance as well as the direction I moved in. So for example, again, if I started over here on this triangle, my displacement would be this length as well as at what angle I moved at. Velocity is actually the rate of change of displacement uh, uh, of an object with respect to time. So now when we figured out that from here to here was like 50 meters, right? How fast was it moving? Well, we could determine the speed. We know the speed formula. This is divided by time. But since we now have to talk about displacement, we also need the direction. So if again, this was 50 meters and I move at a rate of five meters per second, it would take me 10 seconds to get to this point. But in order for it to be velocity, I actually need to know the direction I went at. So again, if this was, for example, zero degrees, maybe this was five degrees. So I actually moved at a rate of 10 meters per second, five degrees from the starting point. Acceleration is the next step after velocity, and it's actually the rate of change of velocity in respect to time. So now, if I move 10 meters per second in some direction, my uh, acceleration could be how fast I was accelerating, right? So what if I was going, for example, one meter per second at the start, but then I started running, so I was actually running 20 meters per second at the end. So the acceleration will be that change in velocity, again, in respect to time. All these three concepts fill really perfectly together and uh, this is explained here. So in math, we're going to express displacement as S of T. S would probably you could think of it as speed, but I really don't recommend it because again, this is displacement. You need a direction in order for it to work. But either way, S of T is the displacement. V of T would be velocity, and it's the same as this first derivative of S of T. Similarly, the acceleration would be A of T but it's also the second derivative of s of t. So this three things and these two concepts, so first derivative and second derivative, is what we're going to have to use today to answer all our questions. Another really important thing for you to realize is that displacement, velocity, and acceleration are all vector quantities. As you know from the name of this course, we're going to talk about calculus and then vectors. So this right here is a prime example of why vectors are important. Vectors have both direction and magnitude. If you've watched Despicable Me, uh, you probably remember the main character, uh, Vector, and this was his slogan. He could uh, 
do things with both direction and magnitude. So if that helps you remember, then go for it. But essentially, direction is something, again, like where you travel, right? We don't care, we, well, we do care about the actual length of what you traveled, but we also care where you went. So if you went east, that's different than going west. So 50 meters east is the exact opposite of going 50 meters west. And for that reason, we actually need to remember that a negative doesn't just simply mean negative 50, right? That actually means the direction that is opposite of the default. So if you described east as your primary default direction, and then your answer ended up being negative, that means your answer was actually west. So you're no longer going east, you're now going west. If your default direction was up, if you got a negative, now you're going down. So with that in mind, we need to discuss these last few things. So the first one is pretty self-explanatory. When the velocity is equals to zero, you're not moving, right? Because velocity, again, is related to speed. If your speed is zero, then you're not moving and thus are stationary or at rest. However, if your velocity is greater than zero, the object is moving in the positive direction. Again, if you chose the positive direction to be east, or the question said it's going to be east, then that's the direction you're moving in. As when v of t is less than zero, you're moving in the negative direction, which is the opposite of the direction that you chose in the very start. Similarly, when a of t, so the acceleration, is greater than zero, the velocity of an object is increasing. And when it's less than zero, it is decreasing. Again, you could think of it as accelerating and decelerating. So if you want to go faster, you would have to accelerate, like accelerate, right? If you want to go slower, you'd have to decelerate. So start moving slower. The last thing over here is very important. This is what most of your application and your thinking questions will come, up, come down to. And that is the fact that if you multiply the velocity and the acceleration, if you get a positive number, so something that's greater than zero, that means you're speeding up. One way to think about this is that if you're moving, for example, forward, right? And then you also are accelerating forward that means you would get there even faster, right? And so that would mean you're speeding up. But if you were moving forward, but accelerating backwards, that would mean you're slowing down and thus your answer would be less than zero. And so again, you'd be slowing down. This is a lot to cover, especially if you never worked with uh, vectors before or if you've never done physics. So I'm going to take you through all of the examples you need for this chapter. So first, let's just find the second derivative of this function. So here, we were given what the function is. In order to find a second derivative, we first need to find its first derivative. So its first derivative, again, we could use all the derivative rules we learned in 2.1 as the power rule and um, the constant rule and stuff like that to find the first derivative. So over here, all we do is use the power rule, right? So five times four is 20, then we decrease the power by one. Four times 0 0.5 is two, and we decrease the power by one. Two times three is six, and again, we decrease the power by one. Similarly, for the second derivative, we just use this here and perform the different derivative rules we know. So now we have 20 times four, which is 80, decreasing the, uh, the, sorry, the power, we get three. Three times two is six. Now the three is a two. And then here we have a constant times a variable. Again, if we try to apply the power rule, here would be one, right? One times six is six. And then one becomes zero. Anything times zero is one. And so we get negative six. So here we got our second derivative of f of x. Now, the next step would be, of course, understanding what the velocity and the acceleration functions actually mean you know, uh, for a position function. So here we have the position function written out. Again, this should be probably written as a fraction. 
for you to understand more easily. But yeah, we just have the numerator as negative 2 uh, t to the power of 4 minus t cubed plus 8t squared. And that whole thing is divided by 4t squared. So the first step that I would recommend is just trying to remove 4t squared from everything. Because if you don't, you'll have to remember the rule for a function divided by a function. And that's extra steps that you probably don't want to do. Plus, it actually factors pretty well. And so if we divide every term by 4t squared, we actually get negative 0.5t squared minus a quarter t plus 2. Um, if you want to find the velocity function, we simply take the first derivative of s of t. And what we get is, again, just 2 times 0.5 is negative 1. So we get that. Uh, negative 1 for t, that is a constant times a variable. So the t just disappears and we get negative a quarter. And then the derivative of any sort of number is just 0, right? And so our answer here would be nothing until we get the velocity function is negative t minus a quarter. Similarly, a of t is the same as the second derivative of t or the first derivative of b of t. So here we already found what b of t is equals to, so let's take the first derivative of that. Again, we have a constant that doesn't matter anymore, so we don't put it down. And then the derivative of negative t is just negative 1. And so the function for acceleration is negative 1. For our next question, we are given a position function of the following format. Now we need to determine the velocity and acceleration of the object at 3 seconds. So it's almost the exact same thing as the previous question, but now we need to evaluate the function for a certain number. So here, again, just finding what the function for v of t is, we find the first derivative of s of t, which is negative 9.8t plus 34.5. We substitute 3 into our equation and we get 5.1. It's really simple once you get the hang of it. Similarly, taking uh, the second derivative of s of t, you actually get negative 9.8. You could either take the second derivative of this or the first derivative of this function over here, which as you can see would just be negative 9.8. Since we don't have a variable here, for all values of uh, t, the uh, acceleration would be negative 9.8. Now let's go to next question. This question right here has four different questions towards it and that's because this question right here is going to test all of the different concepts that you need to know. So let's go over that now. So we're given a position function that looks like this where t has to be greater or equal to zero. S represents the position of the object in meters. So now we're given units from a motion sensor. And then t represents times in seconds. And we have to answer these questions. The first one is asking for the average velocity of the object between two seconds and five seconds. If you see the word velocity, do not get confused. You don't actually need to find the velocity uh, function for this question. And let me explain why. So to find average velocity, we actually need to find delta so the change in the position function divided by time. And an easy way to remember this is the following. Our position graph is given in meters, right? And if we divide meters by time, we would get meters per second, which is usually the default value or the default units for velocity. If we were to do delta v, so the change in velocity, would actually have meters per second divided by seconds, which would give us average acceleration, which is not what we are asked for. And so for this question, we just need to find the change in displacement. So in order to do that, we just find s of 5 minus s of 2 and divide that by the difference. And so just plug in 5 into our original equation here. And then I plug in 2 into our equation, find the difference of two of them, and divide it by 3. If you do everything correctly, you should get negative 4.5 meters per second. And that would be our final answer. 
for the second question, we are asked to find the instantaneous acceleration at 4 seconds. So now it's instantaneous, which means we don't have to divide by any type of time, which would mean we need to figure out the equation for average, or sorry, for instantaneous acceleration. As we know now, average, I keep saying average, the instantaneous acceleration formula is simply the second derivative of the position function. So here, uh, our position function is this. Finding its first derivative, we get 1.5t squared minus 12t plus 18. The second derivative would simply be 3t minus 12. Plugging in 4 for t, we actually get 3 times 4 minus 12, which of course is 0. And so our final answer is 0 meters per second. So when t is equals to 4, the object is no longer accelerating. The third question asks us to find the time intervals when the object is slowing down. So if you don't remember what that means, let's go back here. An object is slowing down if v of t times a of t is smaller than 0. So in our question, we need to figure out when the product of these two functions is less than zero. So an easy way to do this is to just figure out their factors. So what's the factors of v of t? Again, v of t we found it over here as first derivative of s of t, and that is this. So factoring this, we actually get 1.5 t squared minus 8 t plus 12. And uh, further factoring what's inside the brackets, we get t minus 6 times t minus 2. Similarly, a of t can easily be factored into 3 times t minus 4. So now we are actually given 1, 2, 3 key points on our graph. So now let's use them to create an interval chart to see how the overall function would look like. So here is the interval chart. Again, we were given the points uh, 2, 4, and 6, and we were given the fact that t has to be greater or equal to 0. So now, let's plug those values in. If we were to choose any number between 0 and 2, for example 1, our equation here would give us negative times negative, which is a positive, and so we get a plus. If we choose a value between 2 and 4, for example 3, this would be a positive, uh, sorry, this would be a positive, this would be a negative, and so our overall function is negative. Doing that kind of procedure, we actually get plus, minus, minus, plus. Doing that thing for um, the acceleration function, we actually get two negatives and then two positives. Now, since we need to figure out what the multi like the product of these two functions is, again, just by this definition here, we can just multiply the signs, right? So plus times minus would be would be a negative. This would be a positive. This would be a negative, and this should be a positive. So let's actually fix that. There you go. So now, since we have two places where the functions are less than zero, that would be our answer. So between zero and two, and four and six. This last question here would be a thinking type question because it actually requires you to fully understand what is going on within the question. So it asks, what are the time intervals when the object is moving towards the motion sensor? Again, if you want to remember what the motion sensor is or how it's related to our graph, it is actually the starting point. It is what we're measuring from, right? So S represents the position of the object away from the motion sensor. So if it was never moved away, if it never moved away from the sensor, that would mean our location of the sensor is simply the x-axis, which could be thought of as a reference frame. Again, if you took physics, the word reference frame would make a lot more sense, but in case you didn't uh, take it simply a uh, reference frame is where you're measuring your values from. So in our case, again, the reference frame is the x-axis. Since the motion sensor is located when s of t 
is equals to zero. Now, to see whether or not the object is approaching the sensor, we'd have to see if the graph of the position, the position graph, approaches the x-axis at any point of time. So one way you could do this is of course by graphing the function. If you remember advanced functions, you know that you could factor a cubic expression and find its factors and using those factors you can plot them down and see that way where the graph is going up, where it's going down, where the zeros are. But another way that you could do this is by just using the key points we found before and checking if the displacement has increased or decreased. So for example, at zero, we would start at five, right? Then at two seconds, we'd plug it in and then we would see that if it's increased or decreased. Doing that kind of procedure, you'll actually find out that the answer is between two and six. And I'll show you that on a graph in just a second. So here you go, this is the graphed function. As you can see, we only have one y-intercept and that's at five. So actually trying to factor this would not really work well because you'll only get one factor. However, using the first and second derivative, we can actually find its key points. So for example here, in case you didn't know, to find the derivative of a function, you simply go to functions, miscellaneous, and click this button here. Now inside those brackets, let's put our function. So this is our first derivative. So this is the velocity graph. As you can see, the velocity is equal to zero when we're at two and we're at six. So we stopped moving from that point. We were also moving in a positive direction between zero and two, and then between six and zero. Again, we could verify this using the table we created previously. For our acceleration function, we could just take a double uh, derivative, so there you go, of again of our core function, which is this, and we get this graph right here. So this is our acceleration. As you can see, at four, we are no longer accelerating, which could be seen by this graph here, since we have a vertex at four so we were um so yeah that just proves it again when you have a vertex that just means you got a zero at the other derivative so now let's actually see how this helps us with our question if we wanted to check where the key points were the key points again were two and six let's put x equals two and x equals six into our bank of key values and then we also had x equals 4 from the acceleration uh, function. So now using these three graphs we have split our normal or our position graph into four different segments, right? Unless I'm trying to change this color but it doesn't work. Okay, so our first point was right here at 2. So we got a value of 21. If we go to 4 we see that our value is 13 which would mean that we have decreased, right? We have come closer to our sensor, since our, our sensor is at y equals to zero. So now we could put this into our answer. Then from four to six, we decreased even more because we're now at five. So now we can also put in six into our answer. And so our overall interval is now between two and, f uh, two and six. If we took anywhere after six, right, because we were given six to infinity afterwards, you would see that we're going further and further away from the y, uh, so, sorry, from the x-axis, which would mean if we're actually moving away from the sensor and not towards it. Similarly, if we took any value from zero to two, we would see that we're moving away from the sensor and not closer towards it. And so for our final answer, we can actually say that the object was moving closer to the sensor between 
two and six, right? We can't actually say that it was moving um, towards it. I, I guess I should say this. It has to be between two and six, but not equal to two or six, because here it's actually at a stalemate. It doesn't move anywhere, right? And then it goes back up. So hopefully you understood that part. So hopefully that little demonstration helped you understand this question right here a little bit better. But now we're actually done with chapter 2.3. So here are some homework questions in case you want to practice a little bit more. It's fine if you don't, as long as you understand the concepts that I've presented. Again, I'd like to thank anybody who stayed this far in the video. You guys are truly awesome. Also, if you have any questions, just leave a comment down below. I'll be happily, uh, I'll happily answer them and try to help you guys. So again, thank you for listening and have a great day. Bye bye.